We have convened our colleagues and our friends from Europe today to discuss what are some of the opportunities for our community, for the sustainable development community to help and to support the alignment of uh, both the European recovery plan as well as the European semester process with the SDGs. So as you all know, um, the European Commission as well as the European Council have recognized the dramatic consequences of the pandemic and they have reached a historic agreement to address these consequences with uh, this um, European recovery plan. This plan seeks to address uh, the immediate crisis, but also to lay the foundations for a more resilient and more sustainable Europe. We think that this objective will be successful if um, it provokes a transformation of the region that is aligned with the SDGs. Um, the annual sustainable growth strategy of 2021 that was recently published also um, underlines this factor, but it's true that there are many questions about how this can be operationalized. Um, and so today we've lined up a fantastic panel to discuss these processes and help us understand some of the nitty gritty of them, as well as some of the opportunities again for our community to help uh, in this alignment. So before I give the floor to our panelists, let me just um, explain how the next hour and a half is going to work and then um, give you some housekeeping uh, tips. So we have three panelists that will take the floor first, and then we're going to open our floor for uh, three of the chairs of our European networks that will give us some, some local insights about some of the conversations and the discussions that are taking place in their countries and how uh, their members, respective member states are drafting their uh, recovery and resilience plans. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions uh, from the audience. So we're going to encourage you to use the chat function uh, where you can type your questions and we're going to be uh, looking at those throughout the morning and, and asking our panelists on our, on our chairs. Uh, we may have time at the very end to give uh, someone also the microphone to ask one or two questions. So to do that, I believe that you have to go to participants and then um, you will see an opportunity to raise your hand. So uh, let me get started by introducing our panelists today. So we have Estelle Goeger from a uh, member of the cabinet of uh, the Economic Commission uh, Commissioner um, Paolo Gentiloni from the European Commission. We have Jorge Núñez Ferrer from uh, research, uh, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for European Policy Studies, the CEPS. And we have Eloise Baudin, Policy Analyst from the Institute for European and Environmental Policy. So we're going to get started with you, Estelle. I believe that you want to share your screen. Please go ahead, let's see. Fantastic. We're currently seeing your email though. There we go. So, good morning, everyone. I hope the presentation will eventually open. <laughs> it's taking a good time. The network seems to be slow. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you. Everything working? Perfect. So, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to discuss um, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, its interaction with the European semester, and um, more specifically, how um, it will contribute to the achievement of the SDGs and how we could jointly look at um, how to improve or work towards the operational of the operationalization of this aim of having this uh, key instrument participating to or contributing to um, the achievement of the SDGs. 
what is the recovery and resilience facility? Well, it is actually the cornerstone of um, the recovery plan that was put forward by the Commission in uh, May this year, and uh, that was endorsed in broad principles by the European Council in July. Um, the recovery and resilience facility actually constitutes 90% of the 750 billion uh, recovery package under the, the title or the name Next Generation EU. It's made up of um, 312 billion of grants and 360 billion of loans. So uh, it's a very large scale uh, financial support instrument. Um, that is uh, supposed to uh, finance both public investments in key priority fields and also um, to support reforms. Um, the focus really has been put on uh, the twin transitions, so the green and the digital transitions, um, but it is also uh, in broader terms supposed to um, foster the resilience of uh, the EU and to reduce economic and social divergences. And uh, it complements other uh, instruments or programs of um, the uh, MFF toolbox uh, or of the um, recovery package, such as, for instance, React EU and uh, Schule. So this Schule is this um, uh, short-term work scheme uh, support uh, program at EU level that actually uh, the first bond emission under Schubert took place earlier this week and uh, were a great success. Um, little clarification, um, which is that the recovery and resilience facility is still in the uh, legislative process. Um, I think we have to be clear that um, the great and historic uh, European Council uh, conclusions in uh, an agreement after four days of negotiations in July um, set the broad lines, but then the underlying um, programs uh, or sectoral proposals um, are still in legislative discussions and uh, we should not by any mean forget the role of the European Parliament, both in the negotiations of the MFF and also um, of the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Also because I think that uh, when it comes to SDGs, for instance, the European Parliament might give an additional push into that direction. So the LRF will be fully embedded in the European semester cycle because it is based on um, national plans that all of each member state should put forward. And um, these plans uh, should be um, aligned with the semester cycle in terms of timing and also the main documents. So um, the um, NRF plans should actually um, uh, be aligned or be merged with uh, the national recovery, uh, with um, uh, uh, the plans that the member states put forward usually under the semester. Uh, the deadline would be uh, the 30th of April. And um, they're supposed to uh, implement the country specific recommendations that uh, the member states had been receiving over the previous years, mostly 2019 and 2020. Um, you might have noticed that uh, the CSRs in 2020 were very much focused on uh, the response to the crisis and um, contained uh, or had a main focus on uh, investing and supporting the health sector and fighting unemployment. So um, I will later show uh, for 2021, really the impact of um, the RRF uh, on the semester timeline. But um, so the link, as I said, is that um, the recovery and resilience plans will be or become the main reference document for member states' um, policy initiatives. Uh, what changes compared to the usual semester exercise is that the plans are multi-annual. Um, they are aligned with the duration of the uh, RRF, and um, so we are not in an annual uh, cycle of um, measures that are proposed and that are then monitored, but in a pure pluriannual dimension. And uh, to account for this, the semester will be temporarily adapted um, 
and uh, so and streamlined also a bit so as to um, avoid uh, duplications or overlaps with the traditional rendezvous uh, uh, dates um, of uh, the semester. So uh, we encourage the member states to submit their national reform uh, programs and the recovery business plans in a single integrated document. So this, this will be merged somehow. And um, for 2021, um, the assessment of the commission of the plans that have been submitted by uh, member states um, will replace actually uh, the country reports and uh, but it will be accompanied by a more analytical document of the commission um, and this package will then be put forward to council for endorsement and it's the endorsement by council that then triggers first disbursements um, so there won't be next year country specific recommendations because uh, we will just have adopted, uh, hopefully, if we manage to be in time with uh, uh, the, the kind of timing that we have uh, planned, we will just have adopted member states um, recovery and resilience plans. So it wouldn't make sense to at the same time issue country specific recommendations telling member states what type of uh, reforms to do, what investments to do, what initiatives to take when they have just committed to a multi-annual program. So there won't be a CSRs uh, next year. There will, however, be recommendations on the budgetary side, and we will continue monitoring uh, macroeconomic imbalances, uh, rather with a perspective of um, new risks arising also um, under the effects of uh, the crisis. And here you can see how this will uh, concretely look like. Um, so the first notable difference is that um, we have anticipated the SGS, we have uh, detached it from the traditional autumn package, uh, which will be uh, issued on the 18th of November. So the ASGS, which uh, really sets usually the tone uh, and uh, um, is a, an economic analysis of uh, the current economic context, and that sets a bit um, yes, the tone for the forthcoming year. This has been anticipated so as to feed into member states' reflections um, and preparations of um, their uh, recovery and resilience plans for the, re for the following reason, which is that um, we invite member states to present us already now as of mid-October, at the same time when they uh, present their draft uh, budget plans, um, so we invite them to present a first draft or their reflections for their forthcoming um, recovery and resilience plan. The idea is that we start in a process of um, discussion and exchange between Commission and Member States where we can guide them towards the final drafting of um, their plans so as to ensure that when we eventually receive it, um, the, uh, the adoption will be as quick as possible so as to allow the um, first money, the pre-financing, uh, for instance, to be dispersed quickly. But then, I mean, the rest of the autumn package uh, due on the 18th of um, November remains the same. So we will have the alert mechanism report, um, we will have the joint employment report, we will have the new area recommendation. Um, what apparently uh, I have been informed will be delayed a bit, but for reasons that are uh, not really linked to uh, the NRF, is the single market report that might be delayed a bit. Um, and then you can see that uh, as we advance, usually in February we would have uh, the country reports. This year we won't. Later we would have the country recommendation, country specific recommendations. Here again in 2021 we won't have this because. Um, by then, member states will have submitted their plans, we will have assessed them and hopefully they will have been endorsed and then the cycle of implementation of these plans will start at member state level. Is still up, uh, sorry to interrupt you one second. Now, yeah. what is the link? Yes. It, yes, so we're seeing a black box on the yes. right of our screen, uh, which I think is because you might have the, the panelists uh, open. Ah. Could, you, could you close yes. it and we'll see if that... Um, exactly. Is this better now? Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. That that solved it. Thanks. Okay. 
fine, sorry. <laughs> Um, now, the link between the NRF and um, the SDGs um, can really be seen in the policy objectives uh, that are uh, followed by the NRF. So I already mentioned the twin transitions, so the green and the digital dimension, which are really core elements of the NRF. And um, we have uh, suggested that 37% uh, of um, the expenditure foreseen by member states states under their plan have to go or to be related to climate. And then we have set another target, uh, which is 20% for um, the digital transition. So 20% of member states' plans will have to address um, the digital transition. And um, so I've listed, or here you see listed some of the elements that would fall, for instance, under the green um, component. And I've tried to match this really with the SDGs. So for instance, decarbonizing the industry would um, contribute to the achievement of SDGs 7, 9, and 13. Then we have the circular economy. We have the improvement of environmental infrastructure, biodiversity, sustainable mobility. And here, for instance, um, sustainable mobility, it's the uh, electric charging stations, for instance, where we really encourage the development of this type of in infrastructure. And then, of course, we have the reduction of emissions. So I've really tried always to um, match the relevant SDG. And you see that um, it's more, it's various, it's multiple SDGs uh, that are covered um, by the plan. And so by this um, uh, important financing tool, we will have the means to uh, contribute towards uh, SDGs. Um, the same applies to the digital transition, where here as well, um, in investments or reforms that improve connectivity, uh, help develop digital skills, um, or improve cybersecurity, all of these, they also contribute to the SDGs and not only to SDG number eight, which would be, for instance, the um, uh, more um, classical candidate because it's about uh, economic development, um, no, also SDGs like fighting inequalities or um, promoting gender equality, they are also addressed by um, elements such as uh, digital skill uh, development. Then uh, there is, of course, also the social dimension. And here, RRF, as it is in, embedded into the European semester and um, uh, focuses also or should be an implementation tool of previous country-specific recommendations, this means that the, the European Pillar of Social Rights, of course, also has an important role. And uh, so elements such as um, ensuring equal opportunities, uh, investing into education, inclusiveness, fair working conditions, um, all of these, and then especially, I mean, triggered by the crisis, huh? um, ensuring uh, high quality care, uh, healthcare services, all of these also contribute to SDGs. What is, however, maybe uh, missing a bit, uh, specifically regarding SDGs, and this is where a discussion like the one we're going to have today is very important, is this matching and flagging exercise that I now did uh, tagging or um, uh, indicating the link between, uh, I don't know, decarbonization and specific SDGs. Um, this is something that for the moment, indeed, uh, we haven't reflected uh, enough upon, I would say very uh, transparently. Um, and uh, where we need, will need to see how we can uh, do this flagging exercise. Um, and I think that, um, that so the intrinsic nature of LRF, which is that um, the amounts are dispersed only upon completion of milestones and targets. So the member states' plans uh, will set out actions, but also always a calendar for implementation and targets. And uh, so, uh, the envelope uh, that is reserved for a member state is really diverse upon completion of these milestones. And I think that uh, this monitoring exercise, maybe we have to get progress towards SDGs and towards the achievement of, of uh, improvement uh, towards SDGs. So this is something where um, very transparently I have to say that we are not um, 
uh, very far yet, uh, probably also due to the fact that RRF was um, prepared and designed uh, well as a response to the crisis and a bit in crisis management mode. So uh, we are still in the legislative process, but at the same time, to be able to implement the instrument as quickly as possible so as to make sure that the money reaches member states on the ground as quickly as possible, we are also already thinking about implementation. And uh, sometimes it's uh, difficult to uh, uh, really conceive the next step ahead or, um, well, to take a bit of a higher look on things. And uh, I think that typically on SDGs, uh, there is a need for this uh, exercise to be done and uh, to see how to better link uh, the RRF um, actions and the member states' plans to, um, to uh, the miles to the SDGs. This uh, links again now to the, to the assessment uh, upon uh, achievement of the milestones. So what we will uh, assess um, actually prior to the disbursements at the stage where we receive the draft plans is whether, yes or no, they address uh, the country specific recommendations that have been issued to member states. And here, um, it will be difficult to expect member states to uh, address all of the recommendations they had received. But at the same time, they cannot just pick and choose and decide to disregard, I don't know, I take a random example, uh, recommendations uh, some member states might have received on um, aggressive tax planning, for instance. We will be uh, careful that um, there is really a right balance um, as to the CSRs that are being uh, addressed. We will then, of course, look uh, as to whether the green and digital transitions are being addressed whether um, the actions described in the plans are credible when it comes to meeting the 37 and 20% uh, target. And we will also look um, at the balance with the social dimension, because I know that in the public discourse, um, there's a lot of focus on climate and green lately, but we have to ensure uh, that um, the social dimension doesn't get lost uh, on the way. And um, I think that, uh, for these reasons, it's um, important that the Commission is not seen as just an agent that will um, uh, issue bonds on the markets and then uh, just transfer money to member states and then uh, they use it a bit uh, in the, the way they want. The Commission really has the role to um, steer, guide, advise and ensure the quality of these plans that uh, the investments really um, serve a transformative agenda, investments into the future, and make sense also not taking individually that we have uh, 27 uh, plans that will enable member states maybe to then compete with each other, but rather that the overall um, collective dimension uh, serves really the union as a whole. Um, so this is the, the ambition. Uh, it will be a lot of work. Uh, we are still waiting for the final uh, legal base and see uh, what kind of um, uh, adjustments uh, the parliament uh, might bring. Uh, trilogues uh, will start towards the end of the year. Uh, and meanwhile, we have still to um, start uh, preparing. And here again, as I said, today's discussion will be um, very useful uh, for us to uh, see how to better um, operationalize the link uh, with the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Estelle. That was super insightful and I think uh, gave us a lot of information about where the process is at and what are some of the question marks that are still pending at your end at the, at the European institutions level. And it's very encouraging to hear that you think the Parliament may push even further with the SDGs and that um, the, the evaluation of the progress towards milestone may even be uh, against the benchmark of the SDGs. So this is this is very interesting. Um, I'm going to give the floor now to Jorge Núñez. Um, he has written a number of papers on um, what makes the deal, uh, this this uh, package so so interesting, so historical, and, and, um, and also what are some of the things that we need to read between the lines. Uh, so Jorge, over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, so I, I would like to discuss a bit about the uh, steps from here forward. 
uh, effectively, it was quite an historical decision to create the, uh, the recovery and resilience facility. It has been quite a difficult path, but it shows that uh, the system works, even if it's, uh, there are tensions, of course. It's so not uh, easy decisions to take to create such a financial support at that level. Now we're discussing the contents. And that is where I'm going to put now my, my finger. I mean, I have many years working on strategic development plans, on issues of uh, on national plans, regional, and also even at rural development plans. And uh, there are the ambitions and reality that has to be uh, taken into account. And there are the lessons from also from the financial crisis, which I think we have not really uh, learned completely. Uh, and I've been also looking at public account stability and sustainability. Uh, this, this means that now we are having this very large support that to some extent is even trying to correct. And then th that's why the word resilience appears or mistakes done during the financial crisis, but these are not necessarily the mistakes that some people have in their minds. Uh, so I found that the presentation, I mean, that we just uh, heard is, uh, I find it correct. There are words there that are very uh, important and the words uh, <laughs> implementation and targeting and measuring are important. The, and I have nothing against uh, having sustainable development goals and moving in that direction. I also work with the climate and energy unit and we work on the transition uh, uh, in reducing emissions, but we ha really have to be very attentive of what we're going to do with this uh, this support. Um, there, when the financial crisis uh, hit, we had an enormous amount of uh, actions to uh, with uh, and governments which had taken over what was very much a private sector financial sector debt issue and they uh, started to uh, a program that was of course looking at austerity trying to keep their uh, expenditures and there was an issue in this because they were looking at the economic uh, sustainability let's say they tried to to bring the economy on average and to a sustainable or to a growth path or whatever you want they wanted to stop decline but it uh, lacked issues of social sustainability. And uh, another issue that was missing is how to, how to reach the sustainability, which also required in several countries, what I would say is structural reform. What is interesting to look at that period is to see that some countries got effectively much more indebted, that the actual impact in the economy from the, that part of it indebtedness of liability increases. The liabilities that took the governments over were uh, generated more return than the actual liabilities. This you had 20 something countries in this direction. Then you had the group of countries that took enormous liabilities and debt and the actual return of this liabilities and debt was extremely low, practically nothing. So in other words, you only had debt but you didn't have actually an impact to recover it or to handle it. You can do this once. I wonder if we can do this again. It means that a lot of countries have to really be considering how to focus on sustainability, on digital, on green, on social, taking into account that the actual economic model has to be sustainable in, in all of its pillars, including the economic one because we are facing a public debt crisis, not the debt crisis, but the public debt crisis is something years ago that I was already concerned, several of us were concerned that we may move from uh, a debt crisis to a public debt crisis. And I can tell you that's not very nice because then you put the monetary stability also into uh, in trouble. And I'm a bit concerned that there are a lot of people that thinking now that there are modern monetary ways to just continue churning out money without having an impact in that sense. And that's not true. Uh, and there are several reasons I cannot go into it. This will be taking very long. But it is very important that countries are looking at the uh, 
uh, at sustainability also in the sense not only of trying to address every single one of the sustainable development goals, but what do you get out of them? Because we have, uh, I have seen people looking at the programs that are coming out and saying, oh, they have put more on sustainability point one and more on five, but less on three on methods. You don't, you don't do, uh, you, you cannot do all of them at the same time and not all of them has the same urgency. So there is a need to, uh, to target. We cannot target the whole forest uh, for getting the most uh, risky parts into it. Need to have focus. And for the moment, all the programs sound very good when you read what I saw recently. I see programs, they have all the right words. Now the implementation will be the serious part. It's not ready yet how it will be done and how it will be that after that, the countries become really resilient. And it's not an environmental and social only, it's also the ability to maintain that over time without having the crisis. The social is very important. And there again, I come, there are many calls to take action, like uh, saying polluter pay taxation, that's fine if you have tax, some, something to create some tax neutrality, so something else changes, because with the debt increases, we will have a tendency to have new polluter paid taxes, no changes otherwise, and the, the taxpayers and, uh, and the consumers pay for it. We have to be aware of the consequences. We had the uh, gilets jaunes, you don't, uh, if you remember, it was when there was a tax on that everybody says it's so good, uh, it is on, on petrol. So we have to be really careful how we do these strategies. And this will be a very, very hard job in the next few years, very tough one. And we have to take to make sure that we target the right priorities and quickly. We do have an emission priority that has to be targeted, but this doesn't mean that everything has to go in there. I see a lot of, uh, a lot of measures jumping, going into the bandwagon as if they were related to climate COVID and they are very distantly and sometimes not urgent at all, but we are pushing for that. And some, and there are countries that are going into direction where I wonder if they will manage to actually incorporate the necessary structural reforms without uh, finding themselves in some years that they cannot handle their own uh, their own debt uh, problems so that's what I'm I would like to mention this because I'm sure that the next speakers will speak about the good parts of the sustainable development goals and saying sustainable development goals are a guide they are very useful that we need to prioritize and we need to monitor very closely. And this is my last point is about monitoring. We have a lot of goals that we cannot really measure. And it is very, very important that we are able to introduce and use quickly as much as possible big data and data systems. We are not there yet to be able to look what we are really doing on the ground. Are we really sustainable with what we are doing? Are we not? Are we improving something? Because some of them, we believe we are doing something that may not be related. It's important to be able to measure. And for that, we need to work a lot on, on following and monitoring and really having indicators that tell us what we are, what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge, and you uh, give me the opportunity to, to mention two things. So SDSN um, drafted um, um, a, a, a framework to understand the SDGs in terms of deep transformations and for governments to align both investments, um, to think th about regulatory challenges and to organize cross-sectoral uh, ministries, uh, work, etc. Uh, you can find the six transformation framework in our, our website. Um, we also give a lot of importance indeed to monitoring. So uh, we have recently launched um, an SDG Today platform where you can see up-to-date data on um, the SDGs, but most importantly, we will be launching very soon our European Sustainable Development Report um, that analyzes the achievements and the and the performance of the EU as well as each of the countries with uh, very very uh, very sophisticated graphics too. And in fact, uh, our colleague Estelle from IEP is um, is uh, collaborating in the drafting of this report. So Estelle, I'm going to hand over to you um, as soon as you're ready. Fantastic, go ahead. Yes, can hear me. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll share my screen. Okay, and I hope that you can see. 
Ah, okay, great. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, for inviting me today for this interesting uh, webinar. Uh, so I'm a policy analyst at the Institute for European Environmental Policy. Uh, we produce uh, evidence-based policy analysis on, on EU policy making and um, We've been doing a lot of work on EU governance, uh, mainstreaming SDGs in policy making, but also now, of course, a lot of work on the economic recovery, how, how to ensure that it's green and sustainable. And, uh, and that's how I'll, I'll start my presentation. Um, when we saw what would be the impacts of COVID-19 on the economy, we've partnered with, uh, with European think tanks that work on sustainability. And we came up with five tests for the European Union and member states recovery packages. Uh, what would be the five criteria to ensure that the packages um, and the investments are sustainable? Uh, the first criteria is a sound scientific basis. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, the public spending is effective and listen to scientists uh, when planning the, the funds. The criteria two is resilience, uh, so addressing vulnerability at its very root. Uh, the recovery plans should strengthen not only economic, but also social, ecological resilience to cope with the multiple shocks, because as we know, COVID-19 is not going to be the only crisis that we face. And uh, there's no need to, to make trade-offs between economic, social, and ecological um, aspects. Uh, the, the third criteria is equity and solidarity. So ensure that those funds prioritize uh, vulnerable households, communities, regions, and countries in the EU. Uh, and then transformation, the recovery plans uh, need to, to lead to new sustainable practices and technologies. It's an opportunity to transform society. Um, and finally, scale. So now it is still unclear how much funding will be dedicated to green, neutral or brown measures, both in the EU and the member states, although there is, of course, already um, some rules around it. But uh, we need to ensure that there is uh, enough funds that go into sustainable uh, investments. So where are we now? Uh, with COVID-19, we can say that there's been some big changes in the semantics and in the, in the principles of the European Union. The Growth and Stability Pact has been put aside uh, with the crisis. Um, and as it was mentioned by, by Estelle, uh, now the, the semester, the monitoring, fiscal economic uh, mechanism are, are changing. Um, the annual sustainable growth surf, uh, survey uh, said that uh, now the RF is rooted. Uh, in the semester and that competitive sustainability and cohesion will form the new growth strategy uh, that the European Green Deal would be at the heart of, uh, of the recovery uh, and that, that vocabulary of competitive sustainability and resilience is quite new. It's coming with Ursula von der Leyen and the new commission, but it was not the case previously. The Commission also presented the four dimensions of competitive sustainability, so economic stability, social fairness, environmental sustainability, and productivity and competitiveness. So um, that's, that's a big change. And uh, the, the recommendations made to member states as part of the semester process have really evolved and uh, they're less um, macroeconomic focused now. They also look at the social and environmental spheres uh, which is a, a positive uh, change. Um, so the guidelines that have been given to member states as part of the recovery plan, uh, well, the, the funds that they will use need to promote the union's economic, social and uh, territorial cohesion, strengthen economic and social resilience, mitigate the social and economic impact of the crisis and support the green and digital transitions. This has been said by, by Estelle, but those are very, um, positive uh, moves. Um, so with the COVID crisis, also there is a major change in governance and an increased power to the European Commission to, to push for structural reform, of course, connecting the RF to the European semester, uh, but also the creation of DG reform, uh, which is a, a DG that will now help EU countries carry out reforms that, will, uh, that are meant to support job creation and, and sustainable growth. 
So now going into the European semester, because we've been we've been doing quite a, a, some work on this in the past year, and and how can SDGs be be mainstream in the in the process? So the European semester is the annual uh, cycle of economic and fiscal policy coordination within the European Union, and it uh, it has evolved quite a lot because Ursula von der Leyen had committed to to mainstream SDGs into the process, and now there is an an annex. Um, that assess the, the member states' performance on SDGs uh, in the country-specific recommendations. And we, we saw that there was a shift away from the mantra of growth within the European Commission in the past few months. Um, as there is no overall SDG strategy in the European Union, uh, the semester can really be a key instrument to operationalize the SDGs because it has um, an overarching look on the policies that are uh, taken by, by member states. So we worked on, the, on, the, on creating uh, an environmental sustainability scoreboard that could be put within the European semester because uh, although the tool needs to stay focused of course on economic and fiscal um, aspects, sustainable economy uh, could be put into the semester cycle uh, so we created eight dimensions of sustainable economy, which are the size of the green economy, long-term sustainability of the economy, uh, sustainable public finance, green incentives, tax and subsidies, measuring green R&D and innovation, sustainable industry, climate change risk, and negative spillover effects. And this could be measured, uh, measured by um, 15 existing indicators that uh, are already being measured by Eurostat. And they would form this environmental sustainability scoreboard that could be improved over time with new indicators, for instance, public funding for just transition. This could create synergies with the already existing social scoreboard and uh, could introduce a concept of sustainable well-being economy for all, which is uh, something that is already uh, being more and more pushed forward uh, in the EU institutions. Um, now on the, um, the thing with the European semester is that, of course, there is still some implementation gap, although the country specific recommendations are taken very seriously, there is still implementation gap at all level in EU policy making. And uh, the 2017 environmental implementation review showed that the implementation gap was partly due to lack of integration and policy coherence within member states. That's also why a guiding framework like uh, the SDGs is, is quite useful. But what was shown is that there is a lack of capacity and or coordination amongst um, competent authorities at the member state level. And that's partly due uh, because there's lots of different processes and only on sustainability and environment, we see that there's lots of different processes, the European semester, but the, the um, environmental action plan, European Green Deal, environmental implementation review, lots of different um, processes that can be confusing uh, for member states. Uh, and that's what Estelle was actually mentioning. Uh, we need to coordinate the recommendations, the monitoring uh, processes, and we need to pick the right indicators and targets. And of course, that's that's the challenge that we're gonna face um, on the side of the environment. Some indicators will be uh, um, cho chose by, uh, by the commission for the environmental action plan. This is gonna be very important, but we need to make sure that there's more coordinated timeline and at IEP, we will soon publish a paper on, on that topic. So yes, there is the need to align funding, incentives, compliance mechanism to support greater policy coherence for sustainable development at the member state level, but also to enhance uh, democratic uh, support um, because the citizens are not aware of all those processes. And uh, if there was key targets, if there was a more uh, transparent uh, processes, probably um, they could be more involved uh, in all of that. Finally, um, what we've seen is that it would make a lot of sense to have an independent assessment of the recovery plans, and this could be done maybe by the European Court of Auditors um, if they have an extended mandate, but it would be, it would be something relevant. Uh, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, um, Eloise. Um, because we're running a bit out of time, I'm just going to ask our chairs to turn on their cameras. Um, let me introduce them. We have Adolf Klochelles from SDSN, the chair of our SDSN German network. We have uh, Angelo Riccaboni uh, joining from SDSN Mediterranean and representing our, our Italian network too. And we have Fivi Konduri uh, from SDSN Greece and also the chair of our internal working group on uh, the European Green Deal. So Adolf, I'm going to give the floor to you first. Okay, thank you, Maria. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for so many who joined us this morning in particular to the panelists in the first round of our discussions. That was very, very insightful. I would like to give some grain of caution in all to this. Uh, so actually we have a fundamental shift in the narratives. If we compare the way the commission president talked about the future of the union last year and this year, you see that the SDGs moved on the back burner in a way. So it, it was not mentioned in the, in the address on the state of the union at all. And also the sustainable growth strategy uh, mentioned the SDGs just once. We, we need to be aware of this, that uh, the crisis is changing the overall narrative and the sustainable development community, we have to, to find a way to deal with it. And secondly, you see that mirrored in the small print. The small print doesn't follow the sermons. We see it now with the common agricultural policy and, and the political consensus achieved in, in Brussels the last days. Also the commission working papers on the uh, recovery plans don't mention the SDGs once. They actually use a completely different narrative. This is reshape and, and, and rescale and reskill is all nice, but it's even not linked in, 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 in the language to the Green Deal. So sort of a Babylonian confusion is emerging. And I think that is very, very important for political communication that we stick to uh, a limited number of key messages around the SDGs, around the transformations. It may be the six developed by SDSN or, or the handful of transformations under the Green Deal, but actually we need to focus on these things. Focus is then my third point. Uh, I think some of the speakers have, have uh, rightly pointed out uh, that we need to focus all this. There's a risk that the stimulus trickles away in a myriad of channels and levels of governments without any long-term impacts. And the problem will be that without reforms and, and structural, adoption, um, uh, structural reforms, all the spending we are doing now uh, if it is not geared to the future, the next generation will pay, will pay twice. They will firstly pay because they have to repay the debt. And secondly, because the money wasn't used in a way that helps with a sustainable future. When it comes to Germany, actually, and, and that takes up Elu, uh, Eloise's last point, there is no public debate on how to link the recovery plan with the sustainable development goals. Actually, we have a list of around 20 off-track indicators under the German sustainable development strategy, indicators from our own targets that are off-track, sometimes heavily on track. There's no public debate whether these could actually lead the way how to design the recovery program. There's a tendency to refinance existing programs. Uh, obviously, Germany is a net contributor to, to all this. Uh, may think, well, uh, uh, we have just 20 billion to get off it. We have to pay maybe 100. So let's use the money in a way to, uh, to bring down our, our public debt again. If you take a look at France, this program France Relance doesn't do any reference to the SDGs or to the Green Deal, although it splits the amount of 100 billion more or less equally to the ecologic dimension, the economic dimension, the social dimension. So in substance, there is a lot in it, but we need 
an explicit reference to the goals the EU had has set for itself and to monitor it along these indicators. And for us as the sustainable development community, I think we have to do two things. The one is we need to show that making reference to the SDGs and to the key transformations is actually helpful with the recovery plans. It is not just a claim, please allocate some SDG numbers to some um, program items. No, we need to show that reorienting all these towards the transformations rolled out in the Green Deal and rolled out under the sixth transformation would really help with the quality of the program. And the second point is in the, my, my last point uh, and uh, referring again to what Eloise just said, we need to engage in the public debate about all these things. There is only limited stakeholder involvement with the European semester so far. Some of the trade unions, the business associations are involved in that process. Um, I just learned from our Ministry of Finance that some sort of consultation is planned for early 2021 on, on the recovery plan, but it's not clear so far whether the sustainable, community, uh, sustainable development community is actually involved in this. So I think uh, going forward from our meeting today, we actually need to make sure that we engage in our respective member states with our governments, with the commission representations to make them, to make clear with them what we actually see as necessary in this context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adolf. Those were uh, fantastic points. Before I give the floor to our next chair, Ad, uh, Angelo, um, for those of you joining us that don't know uh, how we work at SDSN, we are a member-based organization. We have 1,400 members around the world, mostly universities, but also research centers, think tanks, and NGOs. In particular, in Europe, we have 310 members that cover up to 22 uh, countries uh, from the 27. And these, these members organize themselves around networks. I should have said this before giving the floor, but our networks are represented here today and they work um, generating knowledge and evidence to policy for policymakers, um, always in support of the SDGs. They, they also draft these very rigorous long-term pathways uh, on sustainable development. And um, they also work on data. So what are the data needs to really understand whether we're making progress to targets and at what pace. And then finally, our networks do what Adolf has just said. Um, they educate on sustainable development and the SDGs, not just academically, but also by creating these spaces of discussion, by bringing together uh, different stakeholders to work together and to um, identify opportunities for pushing this agenda forward. So it, once again, we have here three representatives, um, Angelo um, from SDSN Mediterranean, but also represented in SDSN Italy. Uh, I'll give you the floor now. Thank you, Maria. Thanks, everybody. I'm uh, intervening uh, also on behalf of uh, Sabina Ratti, chair of the Italian Network. And uh, as you said, SDSN uh, is uh, very, very well represented in Europe. So my remark, the remark I share with Sabina is about what we should do, because I mean, challenges in front of us are clear, but I think that we, know, we need to talk about uh, which can be the contribution of SDSN networks to the process in front of us. Because as you said, we have uh, more than 200 members from 22 countries, we have data analysis, we have education uh, programs, research. So I would uh, refer to a few points just to be clear. First one, uh, uh, it, is, it was clear also from the presentations before that we need to work more on targets and indicators related to the 17 SDGs and the six transformations. And both in the planning activity but also in the monitoring activity. So we should see how we can give a contrib contribute to a major focus on uh, targets, SDGs, numbers, and that is something that we should do, we can do, and we needed to push our internal debate, but also European debate on this, again, both in the planning phase and the monitoring phase. 
And uh, I think from what I've heard, that in particular, it is needed a, a contribution in the social sphere, because uh, as usual, there are there is more attention and more focus on the environmental side, but we need also to be more explicit and more and able to find clear targets also in the social side. So this is the first uh, area where we could give a contribution. Second contribution, I mean, it is called next generation EU, and I have not heard to talk about youth. I mean, we are taking 360 billion loans from our children. I mean, so we need to be sure that in the national plans, there is room and attention to youth, because, I mean, everything is done for them, but we need to be sure about that. And also, we need to be sure about uh, the issue of gender equality, because as we know, COVID is particularly harming women. So I think that these two issues of youth and gender equality are particularly important, and we need to be sure that we are able to contribute to the right attention to these two issues. Third, at the same time, I know it is difficult, uh, our perspective is that a holistic approach is always needed. So I understand that we need to give prior, prior priorities, but at the same time, we need to be able to maintain a global and a holistic view. Again, I know it is difficult, but we cannot lose uh, this holistic perspective. Fourth, uh, it was cited, but uh, we should be able to promote it, the lens of resilience. Resilience uh, is, is a concept completely new for our internal debate. So we need to bring uh, in the national debate more and more the importance of resilience as a new compass for EU, but also for national practices. Fifth, I mean, given uh, the importance given uh, to knowledge in the national debate, but also in the European debate, there's not much room for universities and research centers. So this, I think that is something that uh, uh, we need to advocate. That there should be a greater involvement of universities or research centers. I don't see any debate and any contribution or any request on it. Sixth and last one point is that uh, we know that there is a clear reference to digital. Digital is important, but we need to bring to the debate and to the national plans also the purpose of this digital. I mean, it's not that we want to have digital just to have uh, access to Netflix, which is important, but also we want to, to have digital for a greater social integration, uh, to link uh, countryside, rural areas with uh, cities, to give a social, uh, sorry, healthy services to people in an easier way. I mean, I think that we tend to lose the sense of purpose, which, which is the reason why we are doing it. So these are the six points. I will stop here with only one more uh, issue that I leave to our friends of, of SDSN, both at European and global level. We need to, to define a stable dialogue with our uh, members of parliaments in Europe and in national. So we should, as SDSN EU, EU to work more closely. So I think that we should define a platform or a way to work together, because if we work only separately, we will never get any results. So uh, I leave it saying we should do something more structured in order to influence our national and international debate. If we work by ourselves alone, I think we will not get any result. If we work together, we can reach a major result. Thank you very much. I don't know if Sabina would like to add something, but otherwise I close here. Thank you very much. Let's see if Sabina wants to jump in. Perhaps not. That. No, I thank you, everybody. Here I am just to say uh, uh, thanks, a uh, lot of thanks to Angelo because I think he, uh, give, he gives an overview of our points, a very complete overview. So if there is some, uh, I could add uh, maybe something also 
to the debate, the following discussion with our chair, with other chairs, if, if, if feasible, I mean. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, Sabina. Uh, so I'll give the floor now to Phoebe Conduri, joining us from SDSN Green. Uh, Thank you, Maria, and uh, thank, uh, thanks to everybody, the uh, very uh, articulate uh, speeches and the uh, interventions by Angelo and Adolf, uh, they were all very important, and I want to start from where Angelo um, uh, stopped. Yes, we need to work closer together, the SDGs of Europe, in order to uh, identify uh, pa synergistic, synergistic pathways that will allow us to have an impact in our countries and at the European level as a whole. It's very important and I agree. And I also agree with Adolf that we need to invest time and effort in influencing and streamlining, I will even say training, and educating our policymakers and politicians towards building these uh, uh, proposed uh, plans that will be funded by the Recovery and Resilient Fund. These are very, very important points. And uh, I think it's our duty to do something about this because most countries that I've uh, collaborated with, but also at the European level, uh, behind the scenes uh, um, confess to lack of uh, capacity for producing really resilient recovery plans. Now, with regards to what I have to, um, I would like to uh, say uh, in terms of the work of SDSN, I will briefly refer again to the uh, single working group for the energy transition and the six transformations to achieve the SDGs and support the European Green Deal. This is a working group uh, that um, uh, is drafted by uh, senior members at uh, the Athens University of Economics and Business, the, uh, the Enel Foundation, Foundation Rico de Matei, the International Energy Agency, University College London, University of Rome, and so on, but also aims to send very soon this first trap to all all European SDSN, national and regional hubs, and start a, a conversation uh, in order to refine the document, but in also in order to uh, streamline our engagement with regards to how uh, we want to support the joint implementation of the Recovery and Resilient Plan, the European Green Deal, the SDGs, and the country-specific uh, recommendations per state, but also upscale at the EU level. And I am uh, happy to say that some of uh, the things that have been already recommended by the three initial speakers are already uh, done in this report. We have a country specific 3D mapping of the SDGs achievement based on the SDSN index and dashboard, where um, we are, where as you all know by now, we have explicit quantification of the achievement of each and every SDG. Uh, we, this 3D mapping also includes a European green policies, so how European green policies align with the SDGs, how they align with the next generation EU, and how they align with the enhanced MFF. And on top of this, we also have the alignment of the European semester process recommendation. So for each country, we have a profile of alignment of these three different policy framework that thank God are quite consistent between them. 
And we want to use this 3D mapping in order uh, to use it as a basis uh, for constructing recommendation for investment pathways um, that will be funded by the Recovery Resilient Fund, by the Enhanced MFF, and by the European Green Deal. And these investment pathways will be arranged, will be grouped according to the six transformations that have been suggested by the SDGs, that is, uh, by UN SDSN, that is, uh, investments in health education, decarbonization, food production and land sea management, sustainable communities and digitalization. So uh, the idea is to offer for discussion between us and then when the national hubs uh, of uh, UNSDSN confirm this, uh, we can also diffuse it as a tool for policymaker in our nation states and also um, uh, presented at the European Commission level. I should note that uh, in, in this uh, report, we identify uh, not just investment pathways uh, and how this can be supported by portfolios of funding sources, but uh, we also identify the implications for job creation and just transition. And when we are referring uh, to just transition, we're referring to inclusiveness, um, um, reskilling, retraining, and uh, also the social impact of the different policies. And the second speaker uh, talked about yellow vest, and this is one important aspect. It's not just what you suggest as the target or the objective of your policy. You also need to figure out the correct way to go about implementing it. Otherwise, you are just creating social confusion and arrest. Um, and as I said before, this particular report will be useful for, uh, for us, for our internal discussion and consistency. And I, I, I again refer to Angelo's comment, let's have a platform where we really work together for an impact. It will also be important for the politicians in the member states and the decision makers. The idea is to facilitate them identify investments and absorption uh, investments and uh, for the absorption of the available funds at national level, but also creates co create cross country alliances for sustainable recovery. For example, the Mediterranean countries uh, could align uh, because they have uh, common idiosyncratic features. Uh, 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 in addition, this uh, report can be important for the public sector and the business to facilitate public-private uh, partnerships and mobilize the private resources for the implementation of the European Green Deal. And at the end of the, uh, of the whole thing, which is what I want to emphasize in closing my intervention, is that we want to create a climate impact by Mifesto to engage together with the politicians and policymakers all other st relevant stakeholders, businesses, the financial sector, the civil society, the universities, the universities that they have the capacity to train the stakeholders to really construct resilient plans. And in this, um, at this point, I would like to remind everybody of systems innovation approach, which can be an approach that can really methodologically help member states construct really resilient recovery plans. Why? Because it's the Led. It involves multiple interventions acting on different levers or drivers of change, and it is based upon co-designing portfolios of connected innovation actions and projects. And it also accelerates uh, learning, rapid evaluation and sharing of what works and what does not work. What mm -hmm. does this 
meaning practice, it means that we can provide technical assistance to orchestrate the development, the designing of this recovery plan based on country specific needs, identification of innovation opportunity and needs in key systems of value change, pro, pro, comprehensive a portfolio of framework development, intelligent sourcing and assessment of project applications, participatory co-design, highlighting the gaps and providing learnings from innovative projects in uh, existing European portfolios, be systematic and continuous with regards to learning and adaptation processes, and always retrain and reskill. What I'm trying to get across is that this, we are trying to transform using this resilience and recovery plan, the systems in our country. And it is a great opportunity. This crisis is a great opportunity for looking at the system as a whole, integrating the policies, the top-down policies that we have, the SDGs, the European Green Deal, the Recovery Fund, and uh, provide a, a solution Pathways. I'm, I'm, I'm finished. Yes, uh, and provide solution pathways that are really able to transform the system. In closing, I would like to say that the point on managing uh, public debt is crucial. Uh, it is very important that we produce structural reforms that uh, will. Uh, um, create an impact and a positive uh, impact on the socioeconomic system much bigger than the debt that each country is uh, taking. Otherwise, we are creating again an unsustainable pathway which will be detrimental for the future generations. Thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, Phoebe, for these insights. And, and we look forward to this report, especially because we're very keen on what our previous speakers have mentioned, including Estelle and Eloise, uh, this policy coherence that is so necessary to make sure that we're not having uh, negative trade-offs. Um, we have one person that has asked to take the floor. Um, and I think we're going to just give her the, the opportunity to join. Uh, I'm going to ask everyone to turn on their cameras so that uh, you can answer. Um, and I'm going to give the floor to Caterina Germano. I hope I'm pronouncing your, um, your name properly. Um, Caterina, feel free to jump in. And uh, perhaps while she gets her microphone ready, we have a couple of other questions. So um, I think uh, perhaps uh, Estelle, this, this would be most relevant for, for you. Uh, what pathways and instruments are there within the European semester framework to ensure close monitoring of the resilience and uh, the recovery and resilience uh, plans? And, and under what circumstances do you envisage sanctions being possible or any kind of enforcement? So this is actually not built into the semester. This is actually not built into the European semester, but rather into the um, RRF regulation and setup itself, because um, in their plans, uh, member states will have to identify and to put forward a certain number of milestones and targets and uh, they can um, present requests for disbursements twice a year. And so twice a year when they present a request for disbursement, they will have to prove that a certain number of milestones and targets have been reached. And then we assess, um, mm -hmm. say whether we believe that this is the case. And then a council has also a role uh, in this uh, to look at it as well. And only then can the money be disbursed. So um, a sanction mechanism as such, well, it would be that we don't disperse because we consider that uh, the milestones have not been reached. Um, this is how, how it would work. Um, thank you very much. I think, 
I believe it, it was Angelo that uh, brought up the question of resilience. Um, and what exactly do we mean by resilience? So um, I'm going to throw these to all speakers. Uh, if anyone wants to jump in, what, what exactly um, do we think is key about, about this word resilience and how, how do we build that in Europe? Uh, Maria, if you want me to very quickly say something on this resilience. Uh, re Yes, yes, please go ahead. But I, I just said, please, very quickly. Very quickly. I, uh, resilience, it's about the uh, economy, the society, and the interaction between humans and nature. And it means that you are better prepared and less vulnerable, vulnerable to shocks. So it means that after a shock, environmental shock, a health shock, an economic shock, you are able to quickly regain your organization structure and function. I can go deeply in it, but we- Thank you, Phoebe. Adolf, please go ahead. But I think there are some problems with the notion of resilience. Um, it came up very, very quickly in, in spring as a new narrative. And obviously uh, due to the crisis, one can understand this. But uh, as I have learned over the time, this notion is quite defensive. It is not uh, progressive in a way that you have a future that you envision. And uh, I was very happy to learn from, from the EU commissioner who is uh, responsible for the foresight processes, uh, Mr. Sefcovic, that they actually say we, we need to build in into the notion of resilience, uh, some sort of the objective society is striving for. And so I think that the sustainable development narrative still is something that is more progressive because it rolls out objectives uh, we are working for. You can obviously also include into resilience a future of a stable society in the future, but that is a little bit difficult. But I think this all mirrors the change in narrative. Uh, Commission President uh, von der Leyen spoke a lot on fragility. That is more or less the flip side of, of resilience. So, and, and I think what we should make sure is that we have a vision of a society that actually strives for human well-being. Thank you. Yes, if I, if I can just, just you, you just said something very important. I think resilience, it's really the capacity to uh, go on when things change. This means also flexibility. Uh, that's the, the, the point that some people see resilience as maintaining a status quo. Resilience means also be able to, to adapt to change easier. So you don't have your whole economy doing only tourism or you don't do having another things or you don't focus on one thing and neglect others. You know, you, you can create a, a structure that when, when something happens, it's more mobile like you have a social system that supports people moving from one sector to another. So you avoid this, this situation where you get stuck. This is for me resilience. One of the things I would like to warn is, is effectively the use of words because here I heard today that there are no trade-offs. In all my career, all my life, every decision is a trade-off. And we don't have to forget things like we were speaking about the cap that was mentioned that the cap has lost its SDGs. Don't forget that it lost when it went to parliament. So you have a document that the commission, let's say the bureaucrats wrote, and then the vote, the elected people destroyed. So you, you need to be aware of that because every decision, if you try to sustain more ecology and another thing, there is always a trade-off and there will always be someone that says, hey, I am being affected. Be aware of that. Uh, so that we don't overpromise. I, I'm I'm scared about words. The people want do no harm, do no harm, do no harm. How? I mean, we don't walk. I don't know. There are you know how do you measure these things? We need to have clarity. But this is sustainability. As I said, is is that the capacity to absorb and to adapt to change is very very important. More important than sustaining and protecting things like they were always in the past. I mean. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge. Um, we also have a question about <clears throat> how can the uh, recovery and resilience facility as well as the semester 
be used to avoid divergence from social dimensions, specifically following after the pandemic, um, in particular leaving vulnerable groups behind. Estelle, would you want would you want to? Yes, I think that um, this idea to avoid divergences between member states or to avoid that uh, they uh, increase because we already have divergences. Huh? I mean, uh, let's be also uh, clear about that. So to avoid that they increase and that uh, we go towards a total fragmentation of our union. And this was at the core of uh, the full package of the next generation EU proposal, because what we did at the beginning of the crisis with this um, activation of the general escape clause, so meaning that the stability and growth pact um, does not bite, let's say, um, uh, and also with the temporary uh, framework for state aid, this allowed member states to um, take the necessary measures to confront the crisis. But the thing is that not all member states had the same margins of the maneuver and uh, the same um, capacities to do this. So uh, this is why in, uh, in May we uh, put forward this proposal so as um, to give all member states uh, more support, uh, also with the weighting, with the allocation key that uh, ensures that uh, those most in need, most uh, did um, get the big, biggest, uh, biggest share of, uh, um, uh, of uh, the funds. And uh, so it's the whole philosophy behind uh, the next generation EU. When it comes to RRF more specifically, um, I think that by addressing some of the CSRs that would already help, you know, to, uh, to um, act towards convergence because um, the logic of the CSRs is uh, also to look at member states but in comparison with others and uh, where progress would be needed in uh, some fields. So, um, well, this would be, uh, this would be uh, my reply. And also, um, to mention again the Schure, for instance, uh, that was a part of the April package and that uh, also provides support to, uh, it was open to all member states, but only 17 or 18, I think, uh, decided to apply for it. And so it's uh, an additional layer of support for short time work skills, for instance. Thank you very much, Adolf. Go ahead. Estelle, may I ask you? why the commission didn't include any reference to the SDGs in the, in the commission working documents. Uh, we have uh, the decision to realign the semester with the SDGs. We have the decision that the semester and the recovery could work hand in hand over the years to come. Why didn't you include any reference to the SDGs? Is there a political um, uh, uh, hesitance to that, or what is the what the reason? It's a difficult question. Um, I don't think that it's an outright, you know, uh, or conscious political decision against the SDGs. I think that, as you say, with the crisis, there was a focus or new language was used, speaking about vulnerabilities and how to address them, well then the reply is um, resilience. Um, and I think that sometimes we kind of reinvent our toolbox under the urgency of crisis. And uh, when in the end, I mean, what I always try to argue is that if you look at the policy objective, objectives as such, you find the link to the SDGs, and uh, it is the SDGs, but it's not the same terminology that we use. And this indeed, I mean, I regret it, it's a pity. And uh, I think that um, we can still try to work to compensate this a bit uh, via the implementation, the final, the final decisions and uh, stepping stones towards the uh, implementation of the MRF. And uh, we should come forward uh, with a document before the end of the year to focus again on the SDGs and to explain how um, we approach the SDGs. It will not be uh, what had been uh, called for by uh, the SDG community, but also by uh, co-legislators, meaning a fully-fledged SDG strategy, that it will not be. Um, but it will explain how we intend to take the SDGs forward. Thank you very much. I am, oh, um, Phoebe, um, go ahead, but we have one minute. 
very quickly to say that in the wording, because we uh, dig into the wording of the documents, the European Green Deal, the recovery uh, plan, uh, the SDGs, the wording is not identical, but the concepts are consistent. So what Estelle has said is absolutely true, especially if you study the documents word by word and you try to do the 3D mapping. So it was, it would have been better if, was, if we had an explicit SDG reference, but I think that the consistency is there and maybe this is our fault, the advocators of SDG, we were not vocal enough to remind of this and maybe countries find it difficult to implement the SDGs and it would have been much better if we communicate the six transformations much more um, uh, strong, in a stronger way because that is much more careful. And I like to close by saying that sustainability includes resilience in, in all uh, um, science academic documents. And I think this is the aim of uh, the policy documents as well. There uh, can be no sustainable uh, 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 development without uh, resilience. And of course, resilience includes the adaptive capacity that uh, Johan referred to. Thank you so much. The, there are two more questions, but we only have we have the line for ten more minutes. If everyone agrees to stay, I do want to um, acknowledge Katarina because she had raised her hand and asked something that Eloise, I think you may want to take a crack at because you you have uh, written about this question of how to include uh, well-being focus as opposed to just a very uh, traditional GDP focus on on fiscal policy. So her question is whether um, it would be possible to envisage um, a EU well-being strategy moving away from GDP oriented fiscal policies um, to policies more oriented on well-being. Do you do you want to take the floor Eloise? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's, it's something that's completely possible and a lot of stakeholders are pushing for, for this now. And uh, we've seen it with the, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, uh, which includes uh, New Zealand, Iceland, Scotland, and those those uh, territories have been doing a lot of work on well-being in the past few years. Uh, in New Zealand, for instance, there's a um, 83 indicators that are used to measure the well-being of, of the population and they use those results to, to do their policy making and it's the, the Ministry of Economy who works with this and uh, for now it's, it's showing good results so uh, that's something that could be of course uh, implemented on the long run as part of the European semester in the, in the EU and the European Union could be a uh, at the forefront uh, of, of, of the well-being economy, of course. Maria, may I add something? Yes. Yes, but the problem is that uh, in the last few years, all the movement about beyond GDP was not really at the center of the, of the debate. I mean, a few years ago, there, were, there was a debate about beyond GDP, but in the last few years, it has disappeared. So I think it's... Uh, uh, it is great that uh, Eloise was uh, advocating it. Uh, we hope that uh, we can uh, get back to it. But the impression is that now, also because of COVID, everybody is just referring to GDP and they need to restore it. Uh, so I'm not so optimistic that uh, it is easy to get back to beyond GDP debate. Thank you, Angelo. I think uh, that's a, a very a very clear point this crisis has changed the the debate massively um the last question that we have is very much from our community so we have agreed today that we need to coordinate action across the european sdsns uh, we also agree that we need to bring these processes to our community and to the general public more prominently um, the semester recommendations should be known and understood by, by people. 
Um, and we, we also agree that we need to bring universities and knowledge producing centers um, to provide evidence to this debate. And uh, Phoebe is going to be producing this fantastic report uh, very shortly. But how can, how can we do this in terms of, uh, how can we mobilize funds for these? And um, I know that there are a number of, of initiatives from the European Commission, in particular Horizon 2020 to, to help um, accelerate oh. these goals, but does anyone want to take a crack of how can we fund the support for them? I mean, very quickly, because I've been involved in several projects that are uh, citizens dialogues, radio programs, uh, and things like this. I've been uh, creating some helping to develop some radio programs and information. One of the things is true, there is a lack of information. And these programs have been financed by the EU. One of them was what is cohesion and so on. And, and it was very interesting. And I think that, that there is a lack uh, of uh, really, there was funding also. I mean, these programs then stopped. They tried to continue, but they said without funding, we, we go back into the old things. There is a lack of focus. Uh, also the, the, the citizens, you know, they worried about the things that are happening in their, in their backyard. The, uh, to hearing about EU programs is, uh, you know, not so interesting, or the, even the SDGs, because it's too, too abstract. So it needs to go really, it should be a lot more uh, work to help uh, the, the ones that are reaching the local areas, uh, you know, the national radio stations, the local research, and to, to help them also, because they were, uh, I, I went and I trained them, I explained them cohesion policy, they, had, they, they, they were surprised. They said, oh, but we didn't know all of this. The, there is, there is a, a lot of work to do there, and, and it's necessary to have communication programs that is about bringing awareness. Then we had debates where people came, they had many opinions, it is important it's are open. You don't go around preaching very important no citizen dialogue that is one way and it is a hard job but the commission has started and uh, what i would say is to go on with it then universities this is all it goes through horizon but also the individual dgs are doing one of these programs was financed by dg region not by by the, the dg so there are ways to do it the funding i think is there are so many funding streams i think you can do it uh, and also it's a question of the national authorities when they use structural funds and they have communication and things that they could fund they also could sometimes make an effort to to do these things uh with this funding that is from the eu because they are also responsible for not having communicated to be honest they they also can do this themselves. Uh, it's not always that the EU has to come with their money. When you get already a few billion from the EU to do things, you could have something to communicate the operation. That's all, I would just stop here. It's, I think there are many ways to do that, including involving, of course, universities. We had universities, we have scientists coming to meetings to discuss, for example, climate change and the use of funds and things like this. It's, it's all possible, it's all possible. Thank you. Phoebe. I think the um, Horizon European Green Deal uh, um, calls are a good opportunity and the one that is focused on uh, citizenship uh, participation. We have a lot of capacity. Many of us have been uh, coordinating such uh, programs for 25 years now. Uh, now we have lots of capacity. I suggest, Maria, we create a platform, you know, uh, a uh, a Google Doc, I don't know how you do it. We include all our uh, national hubs and we try to build uh, this proposal, uh, an institution with uh, lots of uh, experience in this can coordinate it. Uh, we have the capacity and we should also bring in our other regular partners that are not academic because this proposal needs not academic partners, explicit uh, co-funding to show that others are interested and deep demonstration projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have the capacity to bring all of this in. It's a good opportunity for us because it's 10 uh, million for some years for us to have the funding to really streamlining our efforts. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, I think we need to end here. Um, thank you to all of our speakers for fantastic insights and for making yourself available to discuss with us. 
we have a lot of homework and we, we really want to bring these slightly arduous processes such as the semester to our communities and make sure that we are participating and we are bringing our points of view. Um, to everyone joining us today, just a reminder that the European Sustainable Development Report will be launched towards the end of uh, November, beginning of December. Um, so we will send you the information uh, about it uh, via email. And we will also be sharing the report that Phoebe is preparing with her team to uh, map out all of these different policies at the national and then at the European level. Um, once again, thank you everyone for joining and we will be uh, in touch with you on, on the next steps. Have a very good day. Bye, thank you.